So you might be feeling overwhelmed saying, how am I supposed to prioritize all that? Well, if you took our concurrent disorders training and various other training, it's the same approach, which would be, don't worry so much about it. These are chronic issues most of the time. If it's not chronic, it's acute. And you don't worry about diagnosis anyways. It's more like a person comes in, get to know them. It might be over time, which is the normal thing. Why should a 20 year or 10 year history suddenly be solved in one session? Don't worry about it. What you are going to worry about is the person comes in and you want to make some connection with them and perhaps their system. Number one priority. Don't worry about it, much anything else. You've got a great history, but if they hated you and had no connection, what use was that? Then you move into the acute. So if they're suicidal or there's something like they're out of the helm and have nowhere to sleep, you deal with that. Then you move on to more of the stabilization treatment plan as you get to know more. And eventually you might even get a diagnosis down the way. But I say people get all hung up on diagnosis because a lot of our system says without a diagnosis, you can't treat them. So just have the maybe this, maybe that if you have to put a diagnosis down. And usually it's for physicians. You as the clinician just put down your best guesses, best ideas and say, here's my plan. Over time, we're going to investigate these different things. And it's going to take time because that's reality. Worry about acute issues when they pop up. Everything else is chronic. It's going to take time. So where do you start? At the beginning. And if we take a motivational interviewing model, it's whatever brought them in in the first place. And you write down that's their thing. You can write down what the referral person, if there was one, what their issue is. And you write down what you think is going on. And you will use those particular three points of view to conduct your interview and assessment and treatment. But as I'm saying is the key is take the pressure off yourself about saying you got to solve this all in one session. And if you're one of those programs that only has a limited amount of time, again, accept your limits saying, I'm probably not going to do trauma treatment with them and all these sorts of things. My goal is to link with them, get a basic understanding of what might be happening and help them get to the next stage of treatment. Some people ask about specific conditions like ADHD and autistic spectrum disorder and tips to work with them. Let me start with the ADHD and ADD. The key, of course, is once you identify that they might have these issues, as we said before, you do probably want to get some medical involvement, perhaps, because there are environmental ways to help with ADHD, such as reducing stimuli or particular jobs, getting accommodations. But a lot of people still sometimes need some sort of stimulant or similar medication to take the edge off. So that's important. The other thing, too, is from a perspective of making sure the impulsivity is actually there and it's not just an artifact of maybe it's some other thing like depression or some other thing that's causing their concentration not to work. Make sure you take the time to nail the diagnosis and that's what it is. Then see the treatment. But the other thing is you're probably dealing with a lot of these people in your gambling uh, patients and whatever you're doing with them you can do with the people with the internet issues. But the real key is a biopsychosocial cultural approach. Take your time, nail it over time, get the appropriate treatment. Now for Asperger's disorder, ASD, and the reason we're raising that is at CAMH, it seems like we're sometimes the unofficial ASD clinic here because people come in under the rubric or statement that, oh, it's a video game issue and then you find out it's ASD. The reality is they require a lot of resources and we deal with them here as best we can if they're high functioning, but if they're not high functioning, it's very difficult. You do need to figure out other ways and other agencies to help bolster if you can, because the reality is they need cognitive behavioral with heavy behavioral approaches a lot of the time and there's specialized training for that as well. So some of the things we do is if they're high functioning and seem to be able to communicate with others and so on, which you would do some screening, you can still put them in some social anxiety or social skills group as one of your treatments. If it has like a cognitive behavioral approach to it, the approach you might want to do is really cognitive behavioral with behavioral. And another key thing is their system. If there's family, parents, they're going to need to do a lot of the work at home you're only showing some of the skills that need to be developed but it has to be done all the time 
in the outside environment. So it's a difficult situation because there's not a lot of resources for ASD and we're always advocating for more and we're trying to work with other agencies ourselves and make linkages to share this population together and work together. So another challenge between not just ASD as well as ADD and ADHD, it could be depression, it could be social anxiety, but some people because of these conditions have a hard time being able to organize themselves or bring themselves to show up to appointments. So one of the tips of course again is trying to find out through rapport what would make it easier. You can say, oh I want to sleep in in the morning. So you might say at the beginning, well, this is not a very good thing, but on the other hand, you say, okay, we can do afternoon appointments, for example. Do you need a couple of phone appointments? If your agency allows some phone appointments to kind of make some connections and build that way. There's different ways to try to find out from them what could work, and that's actually your number one goal. It's not about treat the internet addiction. Your number one goal is how to get you to an appointment or figure out community services. It's like how do we even get you to even get into the services before we even get into things gung-ho. The other thing too is from the system's perspective if there's parents or spouses or whoever as long as the client, patient, youth, person says yeah it's okay I want them involved. So earlier I mentioned about some commonalities between some of the behavioral addictions. So some questions are could you put someone with an internet addiction into a pathological gambling group and that would work and the answer probably is it depends if it's all about gambling it might not because that's the focus and they're saying well this is not my behavior however if the group is more formed around some commonalities that they both share such as social isolation or social skills development suddenly that brings everyone together and how they talk in that group might be well, I use gambling to cope with this, and I use it also as my social group. I use my internet around the social group. Suddenly, in that group, that's the commonality. Just like, again, you can't put, in my humble opinion, a 16-year-old with a 40-year-old because of their, what's in common with them. You have to find that commonality. So if you have an existing group that's specific around a specific behavior and you want to put someone in with another behavior, it might backfire on you unless you create another group, as we say, which is social skills group, trauma group, uh, medication group, these sorts of things. And then you can start putting these people in because they'll have a lot of similarities under those areas. So what's the best practice approach, in our humble opinion, to dealing with internet addiction? Well, it would be using your approach you usually use already for anybody who comes through your door, which would include proper screening, proper assessment, the same techniques we use for many people, which is motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, skills acquisitions, medication, where it's appropriate. And let me just state here, it's not that there's any specific medication for internet addiction. You'll see some literature saying there is, but that's similar to gambling and so on. What I would say at this stage in the literature and evidence is if you, you identify there's a major depressive episode, ADHD or some concurrent mental health issue or medical issue, that medication would help, that would be a good time to use that. One other note about medication, as I said before, there's some literature which I find is not really great evidence about trying to treat an internet addiction with a certain medication beware of that. And the other thing too is with youth and adults, they're quite wary about medication. And so as a clinician, even if you're not a doctor, you can still talk about medication, not about prescribing it, but understanding their fears and concerns and what it actually means to them. Because sometimes the medication, especially if they have ADHD and that's how they're using their internet to treat it, is to take the time to explore all their hesitations around, I don't want to take that Ritalin or whatever, it's going to change my personality or whatever you're still allowed to kind of explore that with them and pass it on to the physician for the time they will have that appointment, for example. And again, since it's a bio, psychosocial, cultural, spiritual approach, one thing I often see is that the person I have a meeting has not even seen their family doctor in four or five years. Just because we're dealing with things as a clinician in a psychosocial perspective a lot of the time and these sorts of things, feel free to kind of say you should see your family doctor just because it's important from a holistic perspective to make sure your physical health is good because physical health 
also can affect internet use. For example, people who are not healthy, have pain, chronic pain and all that, might want to stay home and therefore they start playing on the internet more. If they don't get that investigated or dealt with, it's a factor that will still drive people to have more of a predisposition to these problems we're talking about. Like thyroid and depression and motivation. For example, if the thyroid levels are low and they have hypothyroidism, they might look depressed, but we don't want to give them an antidepressant then. We want to have them be on thyroid replacement medication. These sort of things might seem common sense, but again, somehow the family doctor's often left out and I often hear, well, they have no time, they'll never call me back. This might be true, or it might be just that we think we have that stereotype about the doctor. But I have a feeling the doctors in primary clinic care do not mind working as a team approach to help certain people who are problematic in terms of treatment for everybody. As a family doctor or GP is also important in terms of the circle of care. They usually are somewhere in your community. And if you can't find one, that's difficult and a problem because we do want to make sure the person has their physical health checked into as part of this whole puzzle of trying to understand the person. So biology is not just learning disorders. It could be hypothyroidism. It could be diabetes. It could be all these different things. And I've seen many clients start gambling or doing internet issues and so on, for example, after they've been diagnosed with diabetes type 1. And because of the impact of it, somehow they start using all these strange behaviors to cope with it. So keep that in mind as part of your treatment planning. One thing to keep in mind, again, as a clinician, is the concept of functionality, which should be one of the driving forces of your whole treatment, which is, what are the real goals here? Sometimes if it's just to quit the internet and stop the internet, that's not really a great goal. It's more saying, well, do you want to be independent? You want to be able to live on your own and be self-sufficient? You want to get back into school? You want to have healthy relationships? You want to have things you can see on a functional level that you can actually quantify in some way that you know they're starting to get to their real goals they really want. Because the internet will get in the way anyways of all these goals until they decide, oh, I've got to cut it back or stop it. And because of that, when you see somebody who, and you know this with gambling and you know this with substance use, it's not important that if someone stops all their cannabis, if suddenly they're back in school and they're getting A's and they have relationships and they're doing well, but they're still using cannabis. The goal was not to stop abstinence as the only goal, unless that's what the client wants for whatever reasons they want to do that for. We're here to kind of hit all the barriers towards their goals. So if somebody says to you, does this person have an internet problem because they spend four hours a night on the computer? He says, well, what's the impact? It's always about that. Is it affecting their school? Is it affecting their job? Is it affecting their relationships? If it's not, it's not a problem. You can be psychotic and not have a problem if it's not causing any problems. Most people have problems when they get psychotic. But if you're hearing voices and have a great life, go for it. But the same thing with the internet. If you're doing some behavior and it's not affecting your life in some major negative way, that's the person doesn't really have a problem. What might be a problem is a parent or a spouse going, I don't like it. There's the problem. So now that person has a problem too, like it's a relationship problem. It's like the famous question too, if you spend $8,000 a month on gambling, is that a problem? Not if you're a rich millionaire, but if you're very poor or in poverty and you can find $8,000 and spend on gambling, it becomes a problem, a functional problem. So keep that in mind that as you work through, which is why, again, it gets away from the unidimensional approach of we're just focusing on one behavior. It's more opening up about how do you get the person functional as a general human being, and that behavior will constantly pop up anyways as you're trying to get to it, and then it'll get dealt with.